everyone. Welcome again. So today's lesson will be on the shipwrecks and salvage option of HSC chemistry. And in particular, we've been looking at ships and alloys. And so today's lesson will focus on steel. Now, we know that steel is one of the biggest metals that we see around. We see steel everywhere. But in ships, the vast majority of ships are formed out of steel, just like cars. And so we need to study steel in order to understand its corrosion properties, as well as why we use it in the first place. So let's take a quick walk through history about steel. We have here a pretty typical steel foundry. Uh, so you can see the scale at which um, we produce steel industrially. So we use it as one of the most important building materials in society. Nearly everything's made out of it. So it has a fairly long history since the development of the blast furnace. So the Chinese developed the blast furnace. I th I'm not sure of the date, but they were the first to develop the blast furnace. And we've been able to refine iron ore and develop steel. So, um, so when we got the blast furnace, all of a sudden iron became available, and then we could develop steel from there. So when, alloy when alloyed with other elements or chemicals, um, we classify these metals as steel. Okay, so when iron is bound with or is alloyed with other metals, we call it steel. So we have lots of types of steel because steel is such a useful chemical. People have been sort of tweaking it and making new types of steel, just for different applications. So in general, what we do is we categorize steel into two categories: carbon steels and non-carbon steels. Okay, so we got two categories. So the properties of a particular steel can be predicted using a phase equilibrium diagram. Um, so if you are interested in studying material science in the future, um, so the degree on material science, you'll study in depth what a phase equilibrium diagram is. But basically, it just shows you that if you have this percentage of, of say, carbon and this percentage of iron, what will be the sort of properties of that? Um, and that will be what we call a phase equilibrium diagram. So for those who are interested in material science, um, you'll learn all of this um, very well. So carbon steels. So it's made from pig iron by removing most of the carbon content. So basically when we use the blast furnace, we used carbon um, to help remove some of the oxygen. And carbon gets then ingrained in the steel or in the iron. And that's what we call pig iron, when there's a really high carbon content. And now the really high carbon content makes it very brittle and very hard. So what we want to do, and you know that steel is quite malleable, what we want to do is we want to remove some of that carbon so we get steel, the steel that we're used to. So what we can do to remove that, iron, that oxygen from that pig iron is to blast pure oxygen to the surface of molten iron and the carbon impurities then oxidize to form carbon monoxide. So you've got your molten steel, you blast oxygen into it, pure oxygen, that reacts with the carbon and you form carbon monoxide, and that removes the oxygen from the steel, or from the pig iron in this case. So here's our reaction. So two carbon atoms plus an oxygen molecule gives you two carbon monoxide molecules. So then in terms of your carbon steels, we've got lots of different types. We've got mild steel, so it's less than 0.2% of actually if it's got carbon in it. So less than 0.2% of it is carbon. And we use that for shipbuilding and roofing. It's quite soft and malleable, which makes it easy to shape, but it can corrode fairly quickly. With more oxygen, uh, sorry, with more carbon, so anywhere between, you know, 50% to three times as much carbon, we get structural steel. Now it's stronger, much stronger physically, but it corrodes more rapidly. So you know those girders that they place um, in buildings, and usually in a, some kind of superhero movie, there'd be a big fight scene and there's all these metal girders flying everywhere. Um, those are usually made out of structural steel. Then we've got high carbon steel. So, so structural steel is about 0.6 maximum. So high carbon steel is anywhere between 0.7% and 1.3%, so more carbon. So it's very hard and resistant to wear. So it's really, really a hard substance. 
and we use it for machine parts and tools. So, you know, like drill bits, um, saw blades and things like that um, for tools. It corrodes less rapidly, so that's good because it tends to get hot in those applications. So then we have the non-carbon steels. So non-carbon steels don't contain as much, obviously, no carbon, which makes sense, because that's what they're called. And so here, the biggest one is stainless steel. Everyone sees stainless steel everywhere. Um, so it's 18% chromium and 8% nickel. So it's got a lot of other elements in it. Now, chromium, remember, is a passivating metal, and that will come back, we'll come back to that momentarily. Um, we'll come back to that in another time, why that's useful. But it's corrosion resistant, it's very strong, and is used for pipes, aircraft, and obviously kitchen utensils, your sink, and things like that. High tensile steel, it may have a little bit of carbon in it, so it sort of still falls under the carbon category, but it usually has nickel and chromium as well. Um, so it's strong and hard, corrosion resistant, as well as it, and it's used in gear and engine parts. So if you think about a gear in an engine, it's going to get quite hot because it's you know in an engine. It's spinning very fast. It's constantly colliding with things. There's lots of friction. Um, so it will get quite warm. And so that's why we want to use a corrosion resistant, very strong um, steel for that. Alnico, so it's 13% aluminium, 15% nickel, 5% copper. It's a very, very, very strong, strongly magnetic um, metal. So that's why we use it in strong magnets. It just forms a really, really, really powerful magnet. Um, so we use it for very strong permanent magnets. You've got chromium vanadium steel, 1% chromium, 0.5% vanadium. It's got really high tensile strength, and we use it for axles and automotive springs. So tensile strength means that it, you know, it doesn't stretch very easily. Um, so we use it in springs because you know, it doesn't like to be deformed, so it'll you know, push back on whatever um, is pushing on it. Okay. So all of that kind of tells you what kind of different applications we have for steel. This, you don't need to remember all of them. Just, it's just there so that you, for your knowledge. But here we have a table of various elements that we can add and what they do. So if we add this element, we can sort of expect to see certain results. So nickel, if we add nickel, it increases the strength at low temperatures, as well as it increases ductility, the ability to draw it into wires as well as corrosion resistance. Chromium obviously increases corrosion resistance and increases hardness as well. Vanadium increases strength and shock resistance, so sudden applications of force is what we call shock resistance. And silicon increases resilience, tungsten increases hardness, particularly in hot applications. And molybdenum increases strength, hardness at high temperatures, decreases brittleness, increases resistance to corrosion, and can be more easily welded. So molybdenum kind of does everything, which is nice. But obviously molybdenum is not very easy to get your hands on. So that's why it's only used in, say, the aircraft industry, where they can afford it, and pressure vessels where well, you have to pay for it as well. Okay. So that wraps up today's lesson on steel. So we looked at all sorts of different types of steels. What is steel? And what is the applications that we have for steel? Okay. So we'll move on to the question segment. So identify the correct statement about steels. So A, all steels rust. That's not true because obviously stainless steel doesn't rust. So that can't be true. Steels with high carbon content are resistant to corrosion. Uh, it's true in some ways, but not all high carbon steels are resistant to corrosion, particularly pig iron. So pig iron has a really high carbon content and it's very corrosion, uh, it's very, it corrodes quite readily. However, on the flip side, decreasing carbon content increases resistance to corrosion. That's not true either, because um, as you decrease the carbon content, it tends to sort of increase the corrosion um, level um, until a certain point. So there's sort of a peak where carbon, where you have the most corrosion resistance, and then adding more, you get less corrosion resistance, and then having less, you get less corrosion resistance. So the answer is B. Steels containing more than 10.5% chromium do not rust. So they're essentially stainless steels. They don't rust after you increase past this. Okay. So explain the ability of stainless steel to resist corrosion. So how does it actually do it? Oh, here we go. This is how does stainless steel work? Well, 
Firstly, stainless steel is iron alloyed with chromium. Now, because it's alloyed with chromium, uh, and chromium is a passivating metal, it forms a very thin, invisible, inert film of chromium dioxide on the surface. So there's a chromium dioxide layer on the surface of stainless steel which is very strong and also completely chemically inert almost. So it's f practically unreactive. Now, if that happens to get damaged, the film quickly reforms in the presence of oxygen. So if, for instance, you're like me and cut things on your kitchen sink just because it's you know easy to wipe down. Your knife might damage your the corrosion resistant layer, but that quickly reforms when there's oxygen available. So that's why it's corrosion resistant. It's again back to that passivation um, concept. So when iron is extracted from iron three oxide in a blast furnace, pig iron or cast iron contains 3.4 or uh, 3 to 4 percent carbon. Now steel is produced by melting pig iron and blowing oxygen through it. Explain how this process reduces the carbon content of the molten iron using an equation. So pure oxygen gas is used. The high concentration of oxygen and high temperature aids the burning of carbon to produce carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. So we can form carbon dioxide or we can form carbon monoxide depending on the situation. Okay. So that's how it often happens. So which set of elements all increase corrosion resistance when alloyed to steel? Okay. So we'd look for chromium. So all of them have chromium, which is a bit poor. So that doesn't help eliminate anything. Also, we look for um, we look for nickel or molybdenum because remember molybdenum does a lot of the things that we want. And the only one that has all three is B. So B is our answer. Okay. So silicon only increases hardness. Carbon only increases some of the properties, like strength. Um, manganese, we didn't even talk about. So that's probably not that one. Um, and phosphorus and sulfur probably just make things worse, if anything. So B is our correct answer. So if molten steel, which is called Fe3C, which is iron carbide, is cooled slowly to room temperature, the final product is a solid solution of graphite in iron. Now if the molten steel is cooled rapidly to room temperature, the final product is a solid solution of cementite in iron. Why are different products obtained from these two procedures? Okay? And we know that this reaction is endothermic. Okay? So basically, this is cementite, and this is iron and carbon in solution with one another. Okay, so when we cool um, iron, if, let's say we heat up iron and carbon together, and we let it cool slowly, just leave it in, in a room and it cools down, then we get this, this sort of solid solution. Okay? Whereas if we were to cool it rapidly, so what we call it in the material science world, we call it quenching, so you see in you know all those movies, the blacksmith is working on his you know whatever piece of iron and then dunks it in some water, and that cools rapidly. We get this cementite. So since the reaction is endothermic, the equilibrium will shift to the left as the temperature is lowered slowly. So it'll tend to go this way if we lower, if we keep the temperature slowly um, decreasing. So the products would be mainly a mixture of iron and carbon in a sort of solution with one another. Now the temperature is lowered quickly, the equilibrium will not have time to adjust, and so the reaction and most of the FEC will remain as the product. So remembering that equilibrium reactions aren't super quick. They don't happen mega random, they don't happen at an infinitely fast rate. So if we can cool it fast enough, what happens is we can actually lock these atoms in place, uh, or these compound molecules in place, and that will stop it from forming this solution of iron and carbon. And so this Fe3C will actually stay, um, stay in, the, in the material. Okay. So that concludes today's lesson on steel. So we've looked at a, a lot of different types of steels, carbon, non-carbon, and all sorts of different applications for it. So remember, you don't have to know every single possible aspect of steel, but what you do need to know is you know, what are the applications of steel and what kind of elements go into it to make it 
is useful for a particular application. So I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson.